Do you climb? Oh, I climb, yes. Well, a little tired, but uh, a little bit tougher. I want to assure you immediately that I shall speak not in Greek, but in English. <laughs> but I've put two words on the blackboard which are particularly important. They come from early Greek, Homeric Greek, and they represent a very convenient way in which the early Greeks explained human behavior. Thumos meant the heart, and phrenes meant the diaphragm and the lungs. Those were physical organs, the organs of which we are most aware as we speak and undergo emotions. But if you look in a Greek dictionary, you will find that they stand also for such things as courage, purpose, will, mind, anger, and a great many other words which we now regard as mentalistic. They apparently felt that human behavior was caused by internal organs which initiated behavior. It was not until Plato, some 500 years later, that there did not seem to be room enough in these organs for all the subtle aspects of mind which Plato and his associates thought he could detect in human behavior. And so Plato broke the world into two parts, a physical world and a mental one. And of course, that distinction has survived to the present time and still causes trouble. We follow the old Greek pattern when we say that a man has work to do, but his heart is not in it. We speak of having the guts to do something. In other words, we tend to want to refer still to physical organs, although today we know that they are merely metaphors. The important part about these two words, however, is not that they seem to resolve the problem of dualism by fusing mental and physical into one thing, but rather that they represented the initiation of behavior, not its nature or quality, but how it started. Our own experience suggests that behavior starts in us. Ideas come to us suddenly and we express them. We suffer impulses to act in one way or another. It seems as if we are the initiator, the creator of our behavior. And it wasn't until 2,000 years after Plato that we have resolved that issue by discovering a different originator, a different place in which behavior could be said to start. That was discovered first in the 17th century by Descartes. And he probably would not have discovered it if it had not been for some ingenious people who made simulations of life and mind for purposes of amusement. 
one feature of living things is that they move without being moved. If you were walking through the woods and something moves on the ground, you take it to be alive. And if it moves appropriately, you take it to have a mind. It's a small toy shaped like a mouse. You wind it up and it runs around and looks very much like a mouse and will frighten those who are frightened by mice. It also, if you put it on a table, it will run to the edge of the table and then rather than leaping off into space, it will turn and go another direction. And that means not only is it alive, but it knows where it is and what to do about it. Well, in the 17th century, some ingenious engineers had created automata of this kind just because they were amusing. They looked as if they were alive. We cannot know today what that was like because so many things in our lives move without being moved, without being moved and act appropriately to the circumstances without having to be directed by us. But these engineers had created figures in the royal fountains and gardens of France and they were life-size images which seemed to act as if they were alive. A contemporary described one of them in this way. As you walk along a path in shrubbery, bushes, you see a beautiful bathing Diana. If you approach her, she will hide in the bushes. And if you try to follow her, a Neptune will come forward threatening you with his trident. They were operated by hydraulic pistons and there were valves under the tiles in the paths so that the visitor stepping on a tile, the way you step on something just before those doors that open today, caused some hydraulic some fluid to flow into pistons and it caused the figure of Diana <coughs> to move. And if you went further, you stepped on other tiles and other valves were open and the figure of Neptune moved. Descartes, the philosopher, saw these figures and like everyone else, was astonished by them. And he decided that Perhaps animals work that way. The muscles could be little balloons inflated by vital fluids. The nerves could be strings which pulled on valves somewhere in the brain to allow fluid to flow into the muscles. And he worked out a rather elaborate system. He reserved human behavior, however. Many people think it was for religious reasons, but I think more than that, it was because Descartes knew more about his own behavior than he knew about the behavior of animals and still felt, as the Greeks felt, that much of it started within him. Animals were a kind of automata, but people still had this internal direction. Well, during the 19th century, real reflexes were, of course, discovered, and they were rather astonishing because they suggested that behavior could indeed be due to triggers, exciting causes in the environment rather than inside organisms. And in the 20th century, there arose what was called stimulus response psychology. All behavior was supposed to be a matter of stimulus and response. One behaviorist philosopher, Edwin Holt, put it this way, we are lashed and prodded through life, whipped, pushed, 
in order we we are made to do everything we do because of forces acting upon us. However, it was clear that this would not work for complicated behavior. And stimulus response psychologists like Clark Hall began to fill the organism up with imagined internal originators, not very different from Thumos and Phrenes. The stimulus came in, true enough, but then a lot of things had to happen inside before it could come out as a response. And Edward Tolman did the same thing. He was essentially a stimulus response psychologist, but he filled the body with what he called intervening variables. And he gave them names, hypothesis, for example, so that some internal action was still needed to explain behavior. And today, cognitive psychologists, using the computer as a model, continue with this stimulus response pattern. The computer has input and output, but all sorts of things go on inside as input is processed, stored, retrieved, and eventually issued as output. There was an alternative to this, but it took a very long time uh, to be discovered. The alternative, which is completely ignored by stimulus response psychologists and by cognitive psychologists, is selection. It appeared very late in the history of time, science, scientific thought. Darwin, 1859, that's a very late date in the history of man on Earth, and Wallace, a contemporary, hit upon the notion that species originated, and that was his key word, Darwin's key word, the origin of species, when random variations were selected by their consequences. Wallace in insisted that this would not account for human mental life. And Darwin was very uneasy about it. He would rather have, have explained mental life as a different mechanism, and he sought continuity in order to make sure that the human species simply evolved like all others by looking for signs of mind in lower organisms. And there were many signs. People collected anecdotes in which animals seemed to solve problems in a way that could only be explained if you assumed they were thinking. But the biologist Lloyd Morgan argued that these evidences could be explained in simpler ways, and that it was not necessary to infer mental life below the human level. It was John Watson who took the next inevitable step and said, if it isn't necessary to infer mental life for lower species, why is it necessary to do so for the human species? Is human behavior not also simply uh, to be explained in terms of scientific principles? But Watson missed the main argument in Lloyd Morgan's canon, the argument that you must never use complex explanations if simpler ones will suffice. But Morgan did more than that. And he gave some lectures at Harvard University in the 1890s, giving not only his position of not assuming mental processes unless necessary, 
but talking about how the behavior which seemed to indicate mental processes <coughs> could actually be produced. And in the audience at his lectures was Edward Thorndike, who took a different line from Watson and came up with his law of effect. Now that was the first recognition of the principle of survival of by consequences with respect to the behavior of the individual. Thorndike wasn't much of a behaviorist. He talked about feelings, satisfying and annoying. And Watson had nothing to do with him. Watson adopted the principle of the conditioned reflex, but that was back with stimulus response psychology, and the notion of habit, which was merely a matter of frequency and recency. Thorndike dropped his early work on animal behavior and turned to education. And it was not until the late 20s in Poland by Konorski and in America by me that the relation between behavior and selection became clear. We devised systems for research in which you could make specific consequences contingent on behavior and the effect was to strengthen the behavior very much as natural selection strengthened those traits of species which were successful in surviving and hence survived to determine the, the species. Operant conditioning has moved on from that point and now represents a, an international science with laboratories everywhere in the world doing very reproducible work and showing how behavior does indeed follow from the process of selection when reinforcing or strengthening consequences are actually arranged. The stimulus comes into it, but it is not a prodding or lashing stimulus. It simply determines the probability that behavior will be emitted. And together with other properties of contingencies, it enables us to give a very good account of how new behavior comes into existence and how old behavior continues to survive in strength. Whenever selection tends to produce very complicated results, people tend to doubt whether it could have done so. At the present time, there is a movement in America led in part by a book by Donald Griffin, which argues that even the innate behavior which we should have to attribute to natural selection must show evidences of mind. But given millions of years and the process of selection, I think that even the most complicated innate behavior can be explained without returning to some internal determiner. And that holds also for operant behavior, as I have called the behavior which is shaped and maintained by consequences. A popular criticism of behaviorism, especially of the experimental analysis of behavior, is that it can't ha handle some very complicated things. A young colleague, Robert Epstein and I, began several years ago to do a series of experiments 
to prove that the kinds of things which were said to disprove behaviorism could be generated, produced, and explained. For example, I'm sure you all know the famous experiment by Wolfgang Kurler in which a monkey unable to reach a banana hanging from the ceiling pushes a box underneath, climbs on the box, and gets the banana. Now, according to Kurler and according to cognitive psychologists, that could only happen if the chimpanzee could see what the situation was, could anticipate the effects of moving the box, and so on. Kurler called it insight. Was insight needed, or could this indeed be ex explained in terms of selection, contingencies of operant reinforcement? We did the following experiment. We reinforced a pigeon, a hungry pigeon, when it climbed on a box and pecked a simulated banana hanging down from the ceiling. Sim very simple to do. You just reinforce movements toward the box, then movements toward getting on the box. And eventually, as soon as the hungry pigeon is put into this space, it hops up on the box and pecks the banana. And then you operate a food dispenser and the pigeon eats. We take the banana away now and reinforce pecking a small cardboard box around the apparatus. We put the box at one side of the space and a mark at the other side and reinforce behavior that causes the box to move that way. And eventually, you build up very complicated but very effective behavior in which a pigeon will push the box toward any selected point. Then, to test the theory, you put the pigeon in one day when there is no box under the banana, but there is, another, but there is a box on the other side of the apparatus. What does the pigeon do? Well, we have made careful analyses of video records of the behavior, and I believe you can explain everything the pigeon does in terms of operant conditioning. What it does is to go first to the banana and jump in the air trying to reach it. Its wings have been clipped so it can't fly. Then it looks back at the box, looks back up at the banana, looks at the box. Since it can no longer climb on a box and peck the banana, the other behavior comes into play and it starts to push the box. And the hot spot toward which it pushes is the area below the banana. And I'm sorry I don't have a moving picture to show you of this, but if you were to see it, the pigeon, you would be convinced that the pigeon is thinking this all out by applying insight. It pecks the box and looks up at the banana and the box and it still can't climb on it. It pushes it farther and looks up, drives the box slowly under the banana, climbs on it, and of course pecks the banana and is fed. It does precisely what Curler's chimpanzee did, but in this case, we know why. Curler didn't know much about the history of his chimpanzees, about how much they had pushed things around and so on. But we know precisely what has happened in this case, and we can completely reproduce through operant conditioning the kind of thing which goes by the name of higher mental processes. Another experiment we did, a paper was published in which a chimpanzee shown a mirror, examines itself in the mirror, and then if a spot of color 
is put on the chimp's forehead while the chimp is anesthetized so it doesn't know that it has been done. It will do nothing about the spot until the mirror is put in the space. But when the mirror is put there, immediately the, the chimp looks at itself and makes movements towards its forehead. <coughs> this was said to demonstrate a self-concept in the chimpanzee. Well, within 24 hours after reading that, I had thrown together some apparatus in my basement workshop. It cost me about 50 cents entirely. Didn't need a grant at all. It was made of packing cases and that kind of thing. And in it, we had a mirror, and we could present. We had, first of all, you reinforce standing and facing the mirror. As soon as the pigeon comes into the space, it goes over and looks in the mirror. Then you expose a spot on the wall back of the pigeon, but the pigeon sees it in the mirror and soon learns, as soon as it sees it there to turn and peck, sees one over here, it turns this way and pecks, sees one down on the floor, it turns down and pecks and so on. In other words, you build up a repertoire of behavior under the control of mirrored stimuli where the behavior is in real space. Then you begin to put spots on the pigeon, and it looks in the mirror and pecks its own body. And then eventually, you put a small white bib on the, the uh, like an apron, on the pigeon's neck, and the spot below it. And when it looks down, the bib drops so it can't see the spot. But it can see it in the mirror. Now, if you don't have a mirror there, the pigeon walks around, there makes no response toward that spot. As <coughs> soon as you put a mirror in, the pigeon looks in the mirror and immediately goes for the spot. It can't even see the spot now, but it tries to find it here. Now, do we, we say the, mirror, the pigeon has a self-image? Well, not at all. We know precisely why it has done all of these things. Well, there was one further stage that makes a great deal of difference when it comes to human behavior, and that was the evolution of the control of the vocal musculature by operant techniques. Animals imitate others vocally. They use cries of alarm, threats, and so on, which are vocal. But it's very difficult to shape and maintain a vocal response through operant reinforcement, except in humans. The great step that permitted the human species to break away from all the other species on the Earth was the acquisition, the evolution of a nervous system that brought the vocal musculature under operant control. And when that happened, language could come into existence as a very elaborate social system. And in my book, Verbal Behavior, I attempt to analyze some of the verbal operants which arise, how they work, and how they come together <coughs> in complex speech. I do not regard verbal behavior as the expression of ideas, meanings, information, or anything else inside. The meaning for the speaker is simply the conditions under which verbal behavior occurs, and the meaning for the listener is simply the consequences that follow when the listener responds to the verbal stimuli produced by the speaker. This led to many new properties of behavior. Only in the field of verbal behavior can you have an abstract response. There is no way, except for verbal contingencies, to respond to the mere color of something rather than to a colored object. And 
verbal behavior made a great step forward when it permitted people to begin to talk about what they were doing and why. I like to use a little poem that blacksmiths in England in the, in the Middle Ages used to get themselves to operate the bellows of their forge properly. A blacksmith has a forge, charcoal or coal, and in order to get a hot fire, it is necessary to blow air through it forcefully. And the usual way is to have a large bellows which will blow air into the fire. And the best way to operate a bellows is not a lot of little hooks like that, but go all the way to the top and all the way down and quickly on um, going up. Nothing is happening on the way up and slowly down. So the blacksmiths use a little poem which goes up high, down low, up quick, down slow. And that's the way to blow. Uh, the blacksmith discovers this simply because of the contingencies of reinforcement. When he does it that way, he gets a steady stream of air, the fire glows smoothly, and the iron turns red as fast as possible. But it became very useful when the blacksmith takes an apprentice to operate the bellows for him. And all he need do is tell the apprentice, up high, down low, up quick, down slow. And the apprentice never needs to see the fire. So we can say that the blacksmith's behavior is shaped and maintained by the reinforcing consequences, the effect on the fire. But the, the apprentice's behavior is simply controlled by verbal rules. And need, he, the apprentice needs only to have some other reason for following rules, which in the case of the apprentice might be a pittance ever paid every week, or perhaps merely the promise that in due time the apprentice would become a blacksmith too. Now we give each other advice, we warn each other of unhappy consequences, every culture formulates maxims which are generalized rules of conduct, and we learn them as children, and they guide us in behaving. Every government, every religion draws up laws, tables of laws, and science eventually draws up laws too. All of those, from advice through to scientific laws, always involve a reference to behavior and either specify or imply a consequence. And of course, the major part of a culture, as it is transmitted to new members of a group, consists of these things. Individuals learn how to operate all of the bellows of life and they formulate rules which they teach others who have, do not even need them to come into contact with those contingencies and enable other people to behave much more effectively than would be possible if each one had to learn it all over again during his or her lifetime. That is the great advantage of the evolution of a culture. Well, anthropologists have never been very happy in defining a culture. Two that I know personally call it a system of ideas and values and so on. But a better definition is simply 
the contingencies of reinforcement maintained by those who are already in the culture to induce new members to behave in appropriate ways. This is affected by momentary advice and warnings, by established principles or maxims, proverbs, and of course by tables of laws for religion and government and tables for science which has been defined appropriately as a system of rules for effective action. In other words, all we do comes back eventually to the consequences which have followed our behavior or the consequences which have followed the behavior of those who have drawn up laws, maxims, and offered advice and warnings. What then happens is that different cultures can begin to be subject to selection because those which are most effective in passing on to young people what older people have already learned will be much more likely to solve their problems and survive. So we have three types of selection. Natural selection, which is responsible for innate behavior. Operant conditioning, responsible for the behavior of the individual. And the evolution of cultures, responsible for those accumulations of rules which make it possible for the individual, a member of the species, and hence the product of natural selection, an individual, and hence the product of operant conditioning, to behave more effectively. That has often been said to suggest some kind. Excuse me, Dr. Skinner. Can you adjust your hair a little bit again? Sorry? Can you adjust your hair a little bit again? Oh, this is, oh no, I know what it is, sorry. Excuse me, it's my, I'm recording this, and uh, um, that means I've talked already, already too long, but I'm sorry about that. I was reminding you that the notion of social Darwinism was one of the more unfortunate consequences of the theory of evolution. It goes back, actually, before Darwin to Herbert Spencer, who talked about the survival of the fittest. And for a long time, it began to be argued that one culture could justify ruthlessness in attacking others because that was the way in which cultures advanced. However, we are not talking about that kind of selection, nor is evolution or evolution of species quite the right way to put it. We aren't interested in whether this or that fish survived to the exclusion of another fish, or this or that mammal to the exclusion of another mammal. We are talking about whether this kind of eye or wing or leg or tooth survived as better than another kind. And the evolution of cultural practices is the thing we are concerned about, and they are free and open to all. We are concerned with better ways of teaching, better ways of arranging incentive conditions, better ways of collecting taxes. Cultures work these things out, and when they work, other cultures adopt them. So it isn't a question of social Darwinism. It isn't a question of justifying the emergence of one culture, one race, one nation against another. It is whether or not we are going to advance to the improvement of all of those cultural practices which lead us to do more and more as 
representative of the best in human behavior. Among those evolving practices are some I would like to mention. When one has accumulated a great many facts in a laboratory and applied them to daily life, it is said that you are talking about something about which you don't know very much. It's all right to talk about reinforcing contingencies in the laboratory, but you cannot necessarily apply them when conditions are not predictable or controllable. My book, Verbal Behavior, does not have in it any great number of facts. Everyone is familiar with the kind of fact I was talking about, but my book is an interpretation of those facts, which is very different from the interpretations of verbal behavior and language which have been offered by others. A science is used in this way all the time. Although philosophers of science have very seldom analyzed what interpretation means. But consider, for example, outer space beyond the solar system. In the solar system, we predict pretty well, but of course we can't control, except those satellites which we made ourselves. In outer space, we can neither predict nor control. All we have are particles and waves coming to us from outer space, and we make bigger and better receptors to take them in for study. And of course, as you know, they have been interpreted in many different ways. Early astronomers and astrologers saw patterns in them. They could name them, the Big Bear, the Dipper, and so on. Later on, there were some speculative theories about the origin of the universe. We today have what we regard as a, a rel relatively acceptable theory, but it is nothing more than interpretation. We don't know what we're talking about in a rigorous sense. And that is true of behaviorists who are called in to analyze critical political events in the world, the sudden catastrophic economic changes, and so on. These are beyond control. They are beyond the control of political scientists. They are beyond the control of economists. You can always find one economist who will predict just the opposite of another. And they are doing their best without very much of a basic science. But in the use of the experimental analysis of behavior, in the interpretation of behavior on a larger scale, we are making strides forward. We are beginning to have the kind of basic science which astronomers use. Astronomers use what happens in the laboratory on the Earth under high pressures, high temperatures, strong electric fields, and so on. And in interpreting behavior in schools, in therapy, and so on, in the light of the experimental analysis of behavior, we're doing the same thing. We use principles which have not been extracted from the subject matter we are studying, but are borrowed from situations which are much more happily analyzed. Psychologists like William James and Sigmund Freud found their facts simply in happy accidents. What happened to William James as he sat at his desk 
and allowed his stream of consciousness to pass through his head. What happened to Freud's, in Freud's clinic as he talked with patients? The principles they derived were derived from the very level to which they were then applied. You use principles derived from philosophical inquiry into the mind to explain the mind, principles derived from accidental therapeutic incidents in the clinic to more therapeutic incidents. But the experimental analysis of behavior is fundamentally different. It has a corpus of facts which have led to the extraction of very powerful principles, and they can be used in a very powerful way to tackle some of the critical problems of human behavior which have been of interest for such a long time. It is often said that behaviorists simply neglect feelings and states of mind. There were behaviorists who did that. They were methodological behaviorists. They simply said, two people cannot share information about a feeling or a thought, hence we cannot have a science about them. Logical positivists said the same thing. But the radical behaviorist attempts to account for all aspects of human behavior. And it, I believe, has been successful in dealing with what have the many things which have puzzled people uh, for centuries. Where does self-knowledge, awareness, consciousness come from? One asks, where do the contingencies of reinforcement arise which induce a person to look at these private events? If we assume that they are simply states of the body, why would one talk about them? Why would one respond to them in any way? Of course, you respond to uh, fatigue in your muscles or a headache or a toothache in standard ways as part of your genetic endowment as a member of the human species. But it was apparently not until the evolution of verbal behavior and the occurrence of situations in which one person would ask another, do you see that? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? And so on, that people had any reason to look at themselves and try to find answers. I have been looking at a bouquet of flowers, very lovely. It has played some part in my behavior just a moment ago in inducing me to talk about it. But I have not said to myself, do I see it? Nor would I ever have any reason to say that unless someone said to me, do you see those flowers? And he says it because he's expecting me to do something about them. Well, tell me what they are then. So it isn't until these questions are asked that we go beyond the mere seeing to see that we are seeing. And the same thing is true throughout the field of our behavior. It would not occur to anyone to recall what the breakfast table looked like this morning until someone asked the question, what was on your breakfast table this morning? And we are able to, to say that because we have seen it, but we have had no reason to see that we were seeing it or to report that we were seeing it. Well, I, this is a very difficult field, and I shall not try to convince you that behaviorism has 
the answer to the problem of awareness or consciousness, but I think it has, and I think we are making very great progress. I myself am now writing a book for the cooperation of a Spanish linguist, Jerry Julia, in which we analyze most of the current philosophical principles, intention, belief, knowledge, cause and effect, and so on. And we do it entirely in terms of behavior and an experimental analysis and the principles which emerge from it. I think it's a very important work. I'm very excited about what we're doing. And it represents to me evidence that the interpretation of these very complicated areas is greatly helped, greatly facilitated by the principles which come from laboratory study. The whole notion of self, as in self-knowledge or self-management, can be reformulated. The self is essentially a system of behaviors. We have many selves within us. Each of you has a self, a repertoire of behavior, which is appropriate to your immediate colleagues. You have a different self that you acquired when you were growing up in the bosom of your family. Those are separate repertoires. When you are at home, you use one. When you are with your friends, you'll use another. The problem arises when you take a friend home with you. Which one do you use then? And most of us are aware of the conflicts that arise. There are other selves for our professional lives, our religious lives, our governmental lives, and so on. There is no problem in specifying self or multiple selves in this way. We can watch them originate. We can specify the responses that compose them. And that is, to me, a much more effective way than to talk about some internal agency, some internal creature which is originating behavior in any specific way. Self-management is as important as self-knowledge. We learn how to control ourselves in the sense of arranging environments in which we behave in different ways. And that is much more effective than trying to control ourselves by an act of will or by just merely resolving to behave in a different way. A year ago, I wrote a paper called Intellectual Self-Management in Old Age. I was explaining some of the techniques of self-management in which I engage so that in spite of the fact that as I was then 78 years old, I'm now 79, I managed to create a world in which I can still do the kinds of things I like to do. And with, I think, reasonable effectiveness. For example, old people become very forgetful, much more so than young. If you are content simply to accept this and make mistakes, forget things, and blame it on getting old. That's one solution. Your friends will forgive you. But if you make an effort, you can change your world in such a way that forgetting will not be very important. For example, you turn on the radio the first thing in the morning, and you hear the weather report. It's going to rain this afternoon. So you say to yourself, ah, I must take an umbrella. But when you finally leave the house an hour later, you forget the umbrella. Now, there's a very simple way to solve that problem. 
whenever it occurs to you to do something, do as much of it as you can then. Hang the umbrella on the doorknob and you will then take it with you. I've been writing a book for old people in general, intellectual and otherwise, with a colleague, Margaret Vaughan, and we have in it hundreds of suggestions for old people so that they can not change themselves. They're still going to need hearing aids and eyeglasses and all sorts of things, but they can change their world so that in spite of all this, they still enjoy life. And that is an example of self-management, not by resolving or willing, but by recognizing the fundamental behavioral principle. The only thing you can change effectively is the world in which you live. You can't change yourself. You can't continue some process of developmentalism. That concept, I think, is very bad at all ages, but it's particularly bad after you have passed maturity. The young developing child can be said to be getting better as he matures, but this is a horticultural metaphor, comes from the ripening of fruit, and you all know what happens after the fruit is ripe. <laughs> and that is what happens in old age when you want to stop developing if possible. But instead, you can't arrest that process, you can't stop it, but you can build a world in which you can go on a lot longer enjoying what you do. Well, that is, as I see it, the essence of behaviorism today. The laboratory analysis, exploring all of the possibilities of the selection of behavior by consequences, the extraction of principles which can be used in areas where we do not have laboratory control, where prediction in any specific sense is impossible. With that science, we can do with human behavior what astronomers can do about outer space using physics and the other laboratory sciences. Are there any competing systems today? Well, the popular one these days is, of course, cognitive psychology. The word cognitive is sprinkled through the literature like salt. Uh, you put the word in and it brings out the flavor of what you're doing. But its own flavor isn't very interesting and it is really not worth eating in anything more than a bare minimum amount. I uh, do not believe that cognitive psychology is on the right track. It has taken the computer as a model, and that, as I have said, is a throwback to the old stimulus response formula with a great deal of stuff going on inside to explain how input becomes output. 